Thank you. The only thing I would add, and I'm an amateur on this topic, but I think in northern Iraq they probably would say they'd like to be independent, but it's simply not. They have the they have almost independence in the current situation, and pushing for the next little increment of it, full sovereignty, uh, I think they know is is not realistic. Mm -hmm. But I th think we do have some evidence that it, from northern. Uh, Iraq, that if you ask Kurds, would you like to have an independent state, they do say overwhelmingly yes. And they have most of the features of it right now, including flag, language, things that you know, are attributes of national identity. And so that's the only slight change I would make. I think actually Turkey benefits from the current, Turkey can have a lot of influence in northern Iraq uh, and perhaps even more influence than Baghdad has. I mean, so it has almost a, a virtual protectorate. Um, it's without, it's, it's a very yeah. smart policy yeah. they've yeah. adopted toward the. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Toward the Iraq. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Please, the front row. Well, I can answer the first part of that question. I think, I think Turkey knows that in order to play um, a leading role in the region, it really has to solve its own conflicts. When uh, Prime Minister, uh, Foreign Minister Abdu, um, Ahmed Davutoglu was here in Washington, D.C., and he talked about how they followed, uh, they pursued a foreign policy beyond identity. They said, we're part of the East, we're part of the West, we're part of Asia, part of Europe, part of Middle East. And my question was that how can we talk about a foreign policy um, uh, that does not have an identity angle when we cannot even define ourselves? Uh, so we have a Kurdish problem, and that's weakening, I think, Turkey's hand in the region. And I think that was one of the many reasons why the current government uh, initiated the Kurdish opening. And unfortunately, it wasn't handled well. And the process is in a deadlock at the moment. Uh, but uh, yes, I completely agree that solving the Kurdish problem is Turkey's number one uh, priority. It should be its number one priority. And now that the PKK attacks has um, increased in the last months, and I think it's, it's going to be very difficult for Turkey um, to, um, to go forward with the Kurdish opening. So I think that's why they're trying to kind of, they're following a two-track approach. On the one hand, they're trying to deal with the, the, the terrorism problem, and on the other hand, they really would like to move forward with the Kurdish opening. And they would, they're in the process of drafting a new constitution. And of course, the Kurdish issue will have to be addressed in that constitution. But I think it's a very complicated, uh, Turkey is in a very difficult situation domestically now. Last uh, couple of questions. Why don't we take two questions and uh, these two gentlemen here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Why don't we take your question, please? Thank you. I'm more than intimidated by this. Uh, first of all, retired Navy captain, uh, but my most recent post in the Navy for that was advised to talk about it by a thing. It was in a room just to amplify your remarks about domestic policy. Um, early 19, uh, excuse me, 2008, Barzani and Al-Zabari were having intense discussion about who I thought was a new leader by the name of Barack Hussein Obama. And my, my Arabic was 
still quite poor. I'm learning, but it's getting better. And the Kurdish is even worse. So um, it was going along, and then finally I had to ask, who is this person? And they explained. And I was terribly embarrassed because I, I'm American. I didn't know who it was. And then they said, well, for you, elections are best and inconvenience. And a change of direction for us than we like to get. So they, were, they had a far greater perspective on our elections than we did. And uh, Al Karal Zabari, and he's still currently the chief of defense of Iraq. His famous comparison was the Taliban and Arzani for doing the same thing. And that, he felt, was the solution to this whole thing. It's very simplistic, very soft moment. Uh, the word respect and forgiveness went an awfully long way. He said, we'll be wrong 5% of the time, but the rest of us don't invite you after 5% of the time. So, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we invite, uh, why don't Bill, you want to go first and just some, any final comments, either stimulated by these last yeah. two questions or more broadly? Um, yeah, I'd like to respond to um, our colleague from Al Ahram. Um, I think you're, you're getting a little bit ahead of where events uh, are today and are likely to be in the next few months. I mean, we don't know how well um, the Nasta party or the uh, Ikhwan will do or, or whatever. It's, the new party will do in Egypt. But I would be very, very surprised if um, we see Tunisia uh, move sharply in the direction of having a foreign policy that is uh, primarily dictated by uh, the Nahda party. Uh, and yes, there will be more influence uh, over uh, Tunisian politics by uh, the Islamist current. Uh, but I don't expect it to be as dramatic as you made it sound, where there will be a, a move toward a new block approach. And as far as I can tell, uh, with all due respect to your military leaders in uh, Egypt, they're not about to give up control for the next year or so. The, the, even if the Islamists do reasonably well in the next elections, executive power is still going to be hands in, the, in the hands of the military for the coming year. So we'll see how all this plays out. But I think the idea that we're on the verge of seeing um, a, a, a deep shift toward um, a kind of new alignment of a, a kind of Tunisia, Egypt, maybe Libya, and Turkey as a kind of moderate Islamist bloc is a little premature. Nationalism still counts. National interests still count. Uh, on certain issues, of course, there will be uh, similar resonances. I think all of these countries are already on record as supporting the Palestinians, Palestinian statehood, and that will be an even stronger theme with Mubarak gone, with Ben Ali gone, and so forth. So yes, the, um, things of that sort uh, we're going to see, but, but that's not exactly radically new. I mean, even the old Egypt was, you know, in favor of a Palestinian state. Um, so on what issue might they really come together? Um, Iran uh, possibly they will have similar uh, suspicions of Iran's influence, but for a country like Tunisia, that's very far away and not very important. Um, so I don't know. I, my, my guess is that there are a lot of things that will be uh, sorted out, but the idea that we're going to see Egypt and Turkey in a, in a tight alliance, I think it's going to be much looser than that. I think Egypt will always have its own sense of rivalry with Turkey. It, it, it is, after all, an Arab state. It wants to be the dominant power in the Arab sphere. And it will be jostling up against both Iran and uh, Turkey as regional powers that also want to be influential in that region. So, you know, if you look a little further down the road and you get through this particular moment when Islamists look like they're on a roll, um, I suspect you're going to come back to uh, geostrategic interests being more important than ideology. 